Sure. So I wanted to start by saying something about the motivation for why we did a report on risk management. And I think one way to look at it is from the perspective of the impact it has <coughs> on poverty, which is an angle that the ODI has looked at as well. So of the 5.5 billion people living in developing countries, a fifth live in extreme poverty, but three quarters live on less than $4 a day. And what this means is that many people are vulnerable to entering into or staying in poverty when hit by negative shocks. Or to put it differently, although there's been great progress on reducing chronic poverty, transient poverty is a major concern. And if you think of the major shocks that have hit the world in the last decade, including the global financial crisis, the big food price crises, but also some very large natural disasters, it's clear why looking at risk management and how it can reduce the impact of those shocks is very relevant. But risk is not only a threat. It's also necessary in the pursuit of opportunity. In fact, change and development requires taking on <coughs> some risk, but people may be scared to take on that risk, and especially poor people may be scared to take on that risk because they fear the negative consequences. Let me give two examples. The first is from Bangladesh. In 1970, there was a very large cyclone that killed 300,000 people. In 2007, there was a cyclone of similar magnitude that killed 4,000 people. In the interim, they had really built many shelters, improved their weather forecasting system, but also, given that many people are not that literate or have TVs, developed a very simple but effective means of warning the population about that risk. The other example is from India. The fear of low rainfall is a major concern for many rural farmers in India. And what that means is they may produce uh, drought-resistant hardy crops that don't fetch that high prices on the market and may choose to keep their savings as a cushion rather than investing them in intermediate outputs, in intermediate inputs such as fertilizer. But what we see is that farmers who have access to rainfall insurance both switch from subsistence to cash crops which are less hardy but fetch higher prices and are more willing to invest in intermediate inputs. So I think these two examples illustrate the impact that risk management can have on outcomes, but also the two sides of risk and risk management in terms of both a threat and an opportunity. And so when we think about what the goals of risk management should be, we emphasize resilience as a, recover, as a capacity to recover from negative shocks, which I think many people have emphasized, but also uh, a goal about having the means and confidence to take on risk in pursuit of opportunity. Let me say a little bit more about what we mean by effective risk management. Well, in the first instance, I think we emphasize that there needs to be an important shift from responding to crises as they occur to preparing for risks in advance. A shift from crisis fighting to being proactive and systematic risk managers, if you like. Um, and in terms of what the components of risk management are, um, we see there being four main components, and I'll, I'll use an example to make it more concrete. So the example is the risk of malaria. So the first uh, component is knowledge. This is information on risk management, but also using that information to make judgments about risk. So in malaria, you could learn about the risk of malaria and how to treat yourself. With that information, you choose how to act. <coughs> so protection is measures that both reduce the probability and size of negative losses or increase those of positive shocks. So for malaria, this may mean using bed nets, wearing long sleeve clothes, draining standing pools of water to try and mitigate the risk. To the extent that all not, not all negative shocks can be avoided, insurance provides a means to transfer resources between good and bad times or to those most in need in bad times. So for malaria, this may be health insurance, 
turning to members of your community when you're in need, or even using government health services. And we think that these three components make up preparation, what can be done in advance of a risk materialising. And then afterwards, people cope with what has occurred. And for malaria, that may mean using your savings to get treatment, going to a hospital. I should say, I've presented these in a static way, but actually there's a lot of dynamic interaction. So of course, you can use your knowledge to make different choices between protection and insurance, but also there's dynamism in the sense that there's a capacity for vicious or virtuous circles. The loss of assets that's often accompanied by dealing with negative shocks can make you more vulnerable to future shocks. Now, one way to look at the extent of preparation across countries is in a relatively simple index that we put together on preparation across countries. And we looked at indicators that we think are important in four <coughs> main categories. Physical financial assets, social support, human capital, and state support. And what we see is that preparation appears highly correlated with income, but there are some really interesting uh, deviations within regions, both with similar levels of income per capita. So Chile is much more prepared than Argentina, for example, despite having similar levels of income per capita, or even with differences of income per capita. So I was in Morocco last week, which is in the middle quintile, um, which is more prepared according to this index than South Africa where I grew up, despite having half the income per capita. And I think that really illustrates the importance of policy over and above access to resources in influencing preparation for risk. Um, when we looked at this map and started to think, what impairs risk management in many countries? Well, I think some people think that risk management needs to be very expensive. And we found that actually you can do many low cost measures that are very effective and that the costs of preparation may often exceed the costs of responding afterwards. But certainly to the extent that preparation appears co highly correlated with income, lack of access to resources is clearly an obstacle to risk management. Let me say that this is actually only one of many obstacles to risk management that we look at. And this is something that we really emphasize in the report. Many reports look at risks and policies to address them but not necessarily the obstacles that often impair risk management. And we argue that those obstacles need to be identified, prioritized, and acted on. And let me say something about some of the main obstacles. One is lack of resources, which I already mentioned, but also lack of access to information. Um, so th these maps are from the same climate change model, but show very different predictions for precipitation in Africa in the future. I think it's clear that it can be very difficult to plan policy without clear information on what the future looks like. A second obstacle is missing markets and public goods. Uh, clearly, it's quite difficult to prepare for some risks if formal insurance markets just don't exist in your country, or for example, to deal with health risks if you don't have access to clean water and sanitation. Another risk is lack of collective action, which may often be because individuals don't have the incentives to act on important collective risks. This photo, which is actually on the cover of the ODI annual report, is from Jakarta, and it's actually after some of these waterways are ju were just cleaned up. But it illustrates a common problem in many Asian cities, which is that garbage, rubbish, fills up drainage systems. Nobody <coughs> feels like it's their responsibility to clean those up. But when heavy rains come, flooding is very much exacerbated by the fact that the drainage systems don't work well. Another obstacle is cognitive and behavioral failures. We know that people may make errors judging probabilities or especially assessing risks that evolve over a long time period. But perhaps more importantly, they may not act on those risks even when they know they're important. So I think we all know that texting whilst driving is not really great for safety, but <coughs> many people do it. And I think these kind of failures are true not only of individuals, but also of communities and institutions. So for example, although as the donor community we know that preparation for risk is very important, 
it's difficult to act on that. And still an overwhelming majority of disaster assistance, for example, goes to response rather than preparation. <coughs> The final obstacle I wanted to mention is political economy issues. And I think this includes some of the usual ones like corruption and lack of capacity, as well as some that are specific to risk management, particularly the fact that costs of preparing for risk are upfront, but the benefits are in the future and uncertain. And the fact that recovering from a crisis may make you look politically very good but preventing a crisis may be quite invisible. And I think this points to something that Rasmus might come back to, which is about the need for institutions possibly separated from the political process, especially for dealing with long-term risks. Um, and so I just wanted to end on this, which I know is difficult to read, but it really, it, it's a set of screens which we think uh, represent layers of thinking. And so you would start with thinking about what risks you face, but then also really think through the obstacles to risk management, incentives, do the right people have access to the information they need, are there behavioral problems, is lack of resources really the binding constraint, and use that assessment to inform policy decisions. Which isn't to say that it's easy and there won't be trade-offs, but I think that this might help identify some of the critical gaps that can improve risk management. So I've argued that effective risk management really requires preparation in advance. It requires addressing the obstacles to risk management, but it also requires thinking about the relative contributions of different actors in society. And that's what Rasmus will talk about.